Morning folks, I'm Dave Canterbury with Self Reliance Outfitters and the Pathfinder School. And in this segment of the Sportsman's Workshop, we're going to talk about net making supplies. We've always taught in the Pathfinder School, and I've written in my books as well as some articles, that survival begins at the water's edge. And the reason for that mentality is obviously we have to have water for our short-term survivability, but also the mammals, the fish, the reptiles, the birds, the turtles, they all need that water as well. So areas around water are always going to be good places to hunt, fish, and trap. Nets are a very easy way to secure food around the water's edge. They're also very versatile items for other things like carrying items, making hammocks, land net traps like they use for rabbits in net purses over in the UK. But net making is a very important skill and nothing could be more evident than this season of alone. I watched it last night again because Larry Roberts is a good friend of mine and David McIntyre is also a friend of mine and they are starting to get some fish now on the water's edge either with some type of a hand line or drop line or a net and what I notice is and David McIntyre kind of alluded to this a little bit last night we should talk about it while we're talking about nets is that he said he thought the mesh size of his net was too small and it's very important to understand that a net has to be calibrated or created for the environment it's going to be used. Now I would assume that these nets they give these guys on the show are set up for that type of environment. But if you look at what people are catching and the fish that are being caught in these nets, most of the fish are caught at the bottom of the net. And what that tells me is the area where the net is laying down and the fish are swimming along the bottom is where they're getting hung in the net. They're not getting hung up in the body of the net which means you have a mesh problem. You either have too big or too small. David McIntyre at this point has deduced that it's too small of mesh and the fish are just not getting gilled or hung in the net. In other words, when they try to swim through the net and their gills open up, they can't get back out and they can't go all the way through because it's smaller than their body size. So the mesh is the important part of a net. And when you're making a net, you wanna be able to make that net on the fly if you can unless you've got a net that's made specifically for the environment you're going to be operating in. So understanding basic net making can A, allow you to do it on the fly like David McIntyre is doing now in the series alone, but it can also allow you to not only repair but make nets for the environment you're going to before the fact. So having these items in your workshop as well as some smaller items in your backpack that we'll talk about in a few minutes or creating them off the landscape like David McIntyre did last night is a very important understandable skill or a very important skills to understand as well. So let's talk about some basic components real quick and then we'll talk about how to begin making meshes on a net because it's a very simple process to make a gill type net. Stay with me. Okay, so first of all, let's talk real quick about books. There are several books on the market that are decent as far as how to make a net, and I've also written about it in my books, Bushcraft 101, Advanced Bushcraft, and there are some instructions in there as well. And you can tie a basic net with just overhand knots, and I've made videos on that as well. But it's a slower process, and it's not a perfect process. You don't get very good symmetric size meshes as you do that when you're trying to hand tie the net. So using some type of needle and a gauge is the best way. So there's three books here that are pretty good if you're looking to buy books. This one comes from Jan's Netcraft. Both of these came off of Amazon. This one has a lot more about knots than it does nets and the, really the netting portion doesn't start till about two-thirds of the way back in the book. This book shows a lot of different types of nets that you can make and different ways to tie those nets. So this is probably the best book of the three in my opinion. This one being the second best and then this one would just be for future reference or further reference material. Now, let's talk real quick about the basic needs. Obviously, cordage is your most basic need. And Carrying a full roll of bank line is always going to be a good bet in your kit. It's part of the 10 C's that we always discuss. Number 36 bank line is probably the most utilitarian style bank line, but it's not the best for making nets. You want to go down to a number 12 or a number 8 like this for making gilling type nets. If you're going to make smaller nets for seining nets 
or things like that for minnow traps, you're going to want even smaller bank line, more like a number six. But for a basic gilling type net for fish that are bigger than, you know, a couple inches in diameter, you're going to want a number 12 roll of bank line for that. Then you need a couple other things. You need a net needle and you need a gauge or a shuttle and a gauge. And the gauge is what makes or determines your mesh size. And I've got a couple different size mesh gauges here. And I've also got a couple that are handmade. This one's made by my buddy Tony Daniel out of a piece of plexiglass. So you can make these out of anything. This one's made out of some palm heart by Alan Tharp, one of my instructors. So you can make these mesh gauges out of lots and lots of things. Any flat object that you can make a uniform size will work for a mesh gauge. And the width, again, determines how big the holes are going to be in your net. And remember that this gauge is half of what your mesh is going to be. So if you've got an inch and a half mesh gauge, you're gonna have three inch holes in that net. That's very important to understand. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. And then your needle, again, can be purchased and they're very, very cheap and made out of, this one's made out of plastic. You've got heavier needles like this one that can be bought in various sizes as well. That's just a closed needle. And these are very convenient for carrying your cordage on as well. They make a great line winder. And these do the same thing, but this is just a little bit more heavy duty. And you can get these in multiple sizes as well as these. Then you can also make your net needles. And this one was made by Alan Tharp out of probably tulip poplar. It feels pretty light. Now I've got a couple other just on the fly needles here that were made in the woods very quickly with only a knife. So you can make the needle yourself or you can buy the needle. As you can see last night on a loan, David McIntyre made his needle and his mesh gauge out of woodland materials. And that's not too difficult to do. And we did a video on that as well in our green woodworking series on Sloyd projects. So those two items, as well as your type of cordage are important. Then you just need some type of sharp knife like a Mora or something like that that has a good sharp blade on it or your jackknife or pocket knife to trim your lines. And if you want to make things really neat and tidy, some type of a lighter to melt that nylon line. Most net line is going to be made of nylon. Now, if you're going to make different types of nets like cast nets, things like that, you're going to need inner rings that, will, that you can wrap that net around and leave it there. If you're going to make purse nets and things like that, you're going to need rings like this that you can put on and take off or a net that you're making in a circle you may want to be able to take this off like a landing net you may want to be able to take this off so these opening and closing rings are really good if you're going to make like a purse net then you want more of a solid ring something like these like a solid split ring like a keychain ring a solid works really well for that and those types of nets are more advanced and we'll talk about those possibly in later videos. But right now, all I really want to discuss is the basics of making a stop net or a gill net. The very minimal equipment you need or that you can create off the landscape to do that. And then how to start that mesh. And the only thing you really need is something to hold that very first mesh that you create. And that can be a nail. It can be a stick sticking out of a log that you've got laying down. You've got a growth coming out of it you've chopped it off and you've got a solid place that you can put that mesh over top of to hold it that's really all you need it could be a nail i carry a nail in this box here that i can just drive into something shallow and use that to hold it with or you could use some type of pin on a board or a jig so all of those things will work and then one thing that comes in handy is a fid and this is a metal fid just for prying knots loose where you've made a knot, you've made a mistake, you need to get it undone. If you don't have good fingernails and things like that, a fid comes in handy. It's not a necessity. Your necessities really are only your needle, your gauge, and your gauge isn't a true necessity because you can use your fingers, but a gauge makes it a lot easier and a lot more uniform. A good sharp knife and your cordage. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is we have to load this needle. When we load this needle, we want to pay attention to how our line is laid. In other words, which way is tighter and which way unwinds this line. And that's important because it'll give you a nice tight line when you're doing this stuff. So push on this middle point, pull it out, and go twice around it and leave yourself a little bit of a tag there, just like that. All right. Then you're going to cross it over, come underneath and over the other side, just like that. And you're going to rotate this in the same direction that the line is wound every time so you're rotating that needle over 
in the same direction that your line is wound. Just like this. That'll keep your line nice and tight. And just continually push that pin up in the middle, flip it over the top, and rotate it in circles just like this. Pull some line off of your roll. And continue. And you want to load this needle up about three quarters of the way up the center spike. And if your line starts to twist on you, you can always just turn your needle the opposite direction of the twist to get that twist out. All right, once we have our needle loaded, now we're ready to start our first mesh. And remember that we said this mesh board or this mesh gauge is one half the width of our mesh. So this is an inch and a half board. We're gonna have a three inch mesh. So what we wanna do is we want to come around this board two times, and that's going to give us a three inch circle when we pull it off the board. And then we can just come in here and tie a square knot in the line right on the board like this. And that's going to be our starting mesh. And once we've tied that square knot, we can pull it off the board and open it up and that gives us a three inch circle to start with. And then we can just trim our tag off, just like that, and we're ready to begin. All right, so let's talk about starting our net. Now, we're going to place this first mesh over the nail and we're going to pull this knot until it's about halfway up that first mesh, just like that. So it's not at the bottom where we're gonna be tying another knot. And then we have our line coming down. Now we're going to lay our mesh gauge on that line and we're going to bring our needle up through this loop, just like this. And when we pull that down, it's going to create another loop here, the same size as this loop. So we want to pull that down right to the board just like this and pinch it off so that any knot we make forms here above on this portion and not down here below. This will become a slip knot, this will become a lock knot. So we pinch that with our finger just like this right at the base of the board. Now we turn it off to the side here and we have two lines on top of the board. If we throw this line over our wrist like this and we come behind it just like this and pull it through, those two lines, I'm have to get it off that nail here, there we go. When we pull this up tight and draw it down, we want that knot to form, like I said, above that loop, okay? We want that knot to form above the loop. So we should have a loop trapped in that knot when we're done, just like that. And then we're going to pull this out. Again, same thing. We're going to put it down here, come up, put it through, pull it down on the gauge, just like this, trap it, throw it over our wrist, come in behind the two, just like that. Again, our nails are on our way right now. When we pull that down, we want it to form right over the top, just like that, and snug it down tight. Now we have one, two, three meshes here that we formed, okay? That are the same size. Now we're gonna do the same thing again. We're going to lay it on top, come through, pull it down, trap it, throw it over the top, come through. Basically, you just formed a half hitch right there over the top of that loop that you made. Now, there's another way that you can do this, another type knot. Most of the time, these knots will hold no problem. But you could also go through the two and then through the one. We'll talk about that now. Okay, now the other knot that we can tie on this, instead of just doing once around, is we can lay this on top again come through our mesh hole and pull it down just like this 
Again, we want to trap it right there at it, right at the top of the boards where we want to trap that. Throw it over and come through for our half inch. Now, what you would do is you would come through both and then you would come up and go through one like this. And that's going to give you a completely different type knot when you do that. It gives you a double lock there. It's basically you just put a double half inch in there. You've put one of them over two lines and one of them between the lines to give yourself a little bit more of a solid lock. And if you're using this type of net for something other than fish, you may want to go with that double lock knot. But you should not have a problem, and I've never had a problem with a single locking knot. All right? Again, now we've created several meshes here that are the same size. We've got one, two, three, four, five. Okay? We're going to go ahead and do six. So this is our sixth one. We pull it down, lock it to the board, get that thing right there at the top, and pinch it off. Throw it over so that we're creating a half hitch. Come over the top and pull it down and lock it in. Now we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, if you look at this and you lay it sideways, you actually have a top and a bottom to this net. This is your top row where your standing line is, and this is your bottom row. So if you've got all the meshes that you want lengthwise, which is going to dictate the depth of your net, then you're going to make the length. And what you would do is you would come up here and you would go one over the top, the top one over the top, the top one over the top, and the top one over the top. And what that's going to do is it's going to put all the bottom meshes at the bottom and the top meshes at the top. Okay, once we've got our meshes down at the bottom, we're ready to start another row. So again, we're just going to drop our mesh gauge down. We're going to come up through our first mesh just like this, catching that loop as it comes up, and pull it down where we need to be, just like this. Again, remembering that we want to form that loop on the top of this. So we come here. Come through the two, pull it down tight. Now, we can at this point leave our mesh gauge on here for at least three meshes. It's not good to leave it on there for more than three meshes because you'll start to get them uneven if you do. So we come up through the next mesh, we pull it over our gauge just like this, trap it, throw it over our wrist, come through, and tighten it down. Now we've got two meshes on the board. Come up here again, pull it down, trap it over the wrist through the two. Careful because your spike will catch sometimes going through there. Now I've gone ahead and added a couple rows on here so let's talk about left to right, right to left. You can see that as we go down a row from left to right, now we end up to where we have to go back the other direction. If we had our net hanging on a head rope, we could just walk to the other side. If we had it on a ring, it would be easy enough just to flip the whole net over if we wanted to go the same direction every time. But I find it easier for myself to use this as an opportunity to practice working with my offhand. I'm fairly ambidextrous as it is, but if you can figure out a way to go left to right and right to left, at the same time and not have to move your net around or flip things over, it makes it easier in the long run. So now we're just going to swap hands and this may be the way that you do it more comfortable is with this hand. I don't know. Remember to trap that knot. That's the most important thing is getting that knot trapped to where it forms over the top every time. So you don't create a slip knot.
And when your line gets short, just pop some more line off. That's the beauty of that needle holding all that line. Okay, so what happens when this thing gets so long that it's uncomfortable for you to work with the length that you've got between this nail and the net? Well, all you do is find a closer top row and go one, two, three, four, and then you're right back to the same thing again closer up and then you can just go right back the other direction okay so once we've done a series of meshes we can pull this thing off here when we're done and we can spread this thing out and see what we got but you should have a pretty uniform decent looking piece of net there when you're done all right all of your meshes should be fairly uniform in size and you can use that net for lots and lots of things. All right, folks, so we've got, you know, a small piece of mesh here, just a quick example of how to create a net. This video really wasn't about the step-by-step -step process in creating a net. It was just how to start a piece of mesh. There are lots and lots of intricacies to making different types of nets. Maybe we'll try to get into that into a series later on down the line, but I wanted to get it out there to you guys that these type tools are also things that you should have in the sportsman's workshop. And that's the importance of today's video, as well as understanding that all of these skills are what make a true self-reliant woodsman. I appreciate your views, I appreciate your support. I thank you for everything you do for our school, for our family, and for our business, all of our sponsors, instructors, affiliates, and friends. And I'll be back with another video as soon as I can. Thanks guys.